thanks to Joel and to Sarah for sound and vision. Um, do we... Maybe, yeah. these, Can we have a bit less light, maybe here? Yeah, that's good. Great, super, thanks. Um, Just reach off. A few days ago, uh, many of you may have heard that Umberto Eco died at the age of 84. At least that was his biological age. His intellectual age, perhaps measured by how capacious his interests were, the number of kinds of books that he had read, and the Borgesian size of his library, this age of Umberto Eco was probably several centuries. A few weeks before that, David Bowie died, age 69. But his real age is probably measurable in light years, or whatever units aliens use to measure time from whichever planet that he came from. I believe that death leaves both of these characters immortal. And one of the hallmarks of this immortality is the extent to which they were never contained by their so-called disciplines. Was Umberto Eco an academic, a medievalist, a journalist, a bibliophile? Was David Bowie a musician, an avatar, a cracked actor? Their intelligences and curiosities spread pandemically from specialist to populist, word to image, station to cultural station. Infectious, relentless, Catholic in the non-religious sense, what other words can we use for the intelligences that journey away from home, and in doing so, claim home wherever they happen to go. It certainly isn't dilettanteism. It's some other kind of agitation. So to my guest this evening, Gianluigi Recuperati is a writer, a curator, and, and director of the Domus Academy in Milan. He's the author of five books, a contributor to La Repubblica, 032C, Dazed and Confused, and many, many other publications. He's also the founder of the Cross-Disciplinary Research Group Institute, Institute for Production of Wonder. You'll soon see that in the book that we're about to discuss, Gianluigi may have set out secretly to survey people in his own idealized image, which is perhaps what we all do, consciously or unconsciously, in love and in friendship. Gianluigi is a writer who not only writes, but also sees stories everywhere. He may love books, but he understands that we're well into some other age where the book is supplanted by other systems of knowledge and reading, recognition, and pattern making. So I felt that the AA was an appropriate context for his new book, 100 Global Minds, since the AA has, for over a century now, been a place where outsiders are welcomed and even eventually naturalized. The school has built on architecture's ambiguous foundations in the, in the academy, so much so that post-structuralism could be seen as engineering and Malievich as a template for urban salvation. So what is global and what does it possess? What does it take to possess a mind at a global scale? Will you please join me in welcoming Gianluigi Recuperati? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shuman. So, when I was 20 or 19 or 18, uh, and I started college, litera literature, uh, one of the curses that professors and the establishment, the academic establishment, and academic establishment, by the way, at the time, and also later, uh, dominated by Umberto Eco, by the way. Like, the Italian academic establishment was dominated by people like him. It was an academic, obviously, and not only an academic, but was for sure part of that uh, uh, environment. One of the curses that were given to people to, as cures, as a curse, was eclectic. So. If you wanted to curse someone, if you wanted to launch a fatwa to someone, you say, you said at that time, so this guy, this boy, or this girl is an eclectic. And because 
she or he wants to do many, too many things. She wants to eat too many dishes and uh, is instability, curiosity. All this kind of uh, electric activity of the brain were kind of uh, neglected and accusatory and, and seen as an, 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 a possible accusation in the uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in those holes that were uh, the depository of knowledge. Uh, 25, 20 years later, that kind of curiosity, uh, unsatisfaction with knowledge, like uh, the opposite of famine, of famine, like the opposite, like constant hunger, constant instability in changing, uh, from subject to subject, cultural multi multitasking, etc. All these kind of activities are the common denominator, the common activity of uh, intellectuals and regular people around the world. In the introduction to this book, I wrote that the world, maybe hopefully, that the, the, the world is about to become, or is already became, uh, a, a Black Mountain College. Is certainly it's certainly a sort of a, a, a hopeful uh, situation, and, and is an op maybe a too an awful view. But in my opinion, what I witnessed with my personal life is a complete evolution, is a complete revol revolution of uh, and uh, a, a cultural shift that is really uh, dramatic because. I was a pariah, pariah at the time in the university. In fact, I'd never made a properly academic uh, career, proper, n n no kind of academic career. And now the situation is completely different. The people who were now at the time considered the future of the academia, at least in Italy, either they had to escape or they found themselves uh, incapable of understanding the world because it's, I'm, I'm speaking of humanism essentially. But most of those people, and it's certainly not their fault, have been completely uh, overcome. I mean, the, the, the specialization that was the main uh, characteristic of academia in humanism, but not only in humanism, but it's, and it's structuralism was certainly part of this specialization. Uh, has become, it is really now a problem for many people like this because they cannot understand the world in which uh, each self uh, is uh, changeable in the length of uh, three hours or four hours or five hours. We are in a, and, and that kind of hyper specialized humanist culture uh, is not space anymore on newspaper. Even newspapers are not like what they used to be. So the Earthquakes, uh, like speaking of age of earthquakes that have characterized the last 10 years and the last 15 years, uh, mixed up with the digital revolution, which is a typical cross disciplinary event because the digital world is made up of figures, numbers, and words. And the tragic or comic mix up of these uh, figures, numbers, and words uh, is really something that is a shared platform for humanity, for understanding and expressing themselves. And this happens all the time. This is code, coding, uh, writing, and drawing, and sharing images. This is really the human, the plateau of, humani of, of humankind, like Karl Zeman would say. This is really what's happening. The idea, basically, is that now the most adventurous intellectuals are those who can understand and address this change uh, by being constant learner and be the best learners. And what one of the best things that you could do when you live in at the borders of disciplines is that you uh, trade a little bit of power in your own discipline for a wonderful curiosity because uh, obviously you become less relevant because if you want to, if your obsession is being relevant, you have two ways. Even you go pop, either you go pop, you go on the popular and you are relevant by occupying space or you are relevant by uh, 
in vain, like uh, by being very specialized. But if you don't decide to be the relevant, but you want just to learn new things, but if your libido is basically about learning, 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 and this is something that uh, is uh, typical of the landscape that we are in. If you think about the mm, interesting and successful, let's call it the figures today, are basically people who wants to learn and to, who made uh, uh, a sort of living, of intellectual living, but sometimes also proper living out of being great learner. And uh, in a school like Domus, for example, I tried to install this kind of attitude in students, like that, the fact that uh, being interested in a constant endless learning with a constant endless curiosity is one of the key to personal happiness also. So that's why I tried to uh, build up a sort of, I wanted to do a 1,000 global minds. So a, an endless book of a sort of constantly evolving book. And now Umberto Eco died, and it's the first person who died from this list. For his, he's the first of the gang to die. And I'm really we are sorry about this, but actually the book is out like since uh, six months. So it lasted six months. Because now there are 99 uh, people who are alive, and like Jonah Friedman is 95 or 96, I don't know. And so, I mean, it's, uh, I wanted to do a sort of repertoire, a repertoire of, of the living best minds in terms of cross-disciplinary exchange. So perhaps you could tell us uh, about the methodology yeah. of, of how you... Well, this is a sort of it. divulgative book, so I wanted to m do a sort of uh, uh, coffee table, brainy coffee table book that could be used as a reference to, to contemporary culture. Uh, so. I used three methods, three different method, methods. First method, I asked uh, uh, 10 students from all Europe, 25 years old, 24, not uh, part of the system, people who are not already employed, by, so with no conflict of interest, basically, to write down a list of their cross-disciplinary heroes, living, working among disciplines, uh, and, uh, and then we should say a little bit about uh, cross-disciplinarity and disciplinarity. But anyway, they give, gave me this list. It, we came, it came out, it uh, reached 500 names. I also provided some other names. So in the end, there was five, 600 names. Then I co-designed in terms of, I'm not coding, I, I'm not a code, I cannot code, but I am like, I, I, I had a sort of inspiration of how this algorithm sh could work. So I co-designed an algorithm with a mathematician. Uh, this algorithm is very simple in terms of uh, coding, but is uh, nice in terms, I think, of uh, as a research tool. Basically, it detects all the time that your name is referred to or quoted in a web environment different from the one that you belong to as an original uh, language. So if you are an architect or a designer, and your name is referred to in military blogs, for example, which sometimes happen to designers especially, and also to architects, uh, then your ranking, your cross-disciplinary ranking gets a little bit higher. Uh, if your name is only quoted in like uh, semiotics of uh, medieval text, uh, your ranking is a little bit down. What this algorithm uh, allowed us was to create a sort of a chart among these 500 names. It was very interesting. And then we put it in, in, in uh, the result, uh, at, at, at least the result uh, regarding the 100 names that we chose in the end, at the, uh, at the end of the book. So basically, what's the flow? It's not a flawless uh, algorithm, because what I found out was that whatever has to do with big data, as a quantitative problem that uh, in terms of cultural research uh, may have uh, uh, not very nice effect, which means most of the people that uh, topped the chart, so that could have made the 100 that we wanted to make, were white Anglo-Saxon males, famous, very famous people. 
like David Bowie, etc. Umberto Eco, obviously, some of them entered anyway the chart. So I decided that I had to create other parameters in order to make it a serious book and not just a sort of uh, like top 100 that we confront ourselves every December or November on magazines of various kinds, Forbes, uh, Art Review, like more or less serious magazine. So I decided to <coughs> use the algorithm and at the same time uh, rejected it. It was a sort of uh, fight uh, with the spirit in a way. It was a sort of uh, evocation, it's like summoning the spirit of uh, big data in a sort of uh, curation. But then in the end, I, I, I really decided that I had to uh, find out other parameters. And the parameters were basically three. I want people who write, whatever they could write, but writers, people who produce books uh, or texts uh, to be more accurate. I want people uh, that are, as uh, in, in terms of biodiversity, more generous than white Anglo-Saxon males of success. And I want uh, people that uh, represent in a sort of fair way the widest range possible of uh, discipline and cross-disciplinarity. Because being cross-disciplinary doesn't mean to being eclectic uh, in a uh, pejorative sense, in a negative sense. It doesn't mean to be dilettante. It means uh, to have your own languages, language, to have your tool, but at the same time to inject the tool that you use every day to know the world and represent the world with other mindsets. All this, this book is basically the continuation of a work that I did with uh, people, very interesting people like uh, um, Ute Meta Bauer, who's part of the book, and other uh, intellectuals, mainly from the art world, Hans Ulrich, Obris, and other people, uh, by asking them to participate in a series of seminars three or four years ago in an Italian city called Torino. Uh, about the possible birth of a new institution, then the institution was stopped because of financial, because of the financial crisis. But we did those seminars, and the institution should have been a sort of a institution devoted to the codes of cross disciplinary, of, of cross disciplinarity. So an institution devoted to uh, a small institution, a small research international institution devoted to study and promote the those languages that act uh, as bridges between l other languages. Obviously, not those languages are not proper languages, but are behaviors, are uh, actions sometimes, are a way of uh, living, attitudes. So it's a semiosphere that is slightly different than a proper language, because we found out that it's pretty stupid to invent a new language uh, to connect two languages that exist. What you need is human being that translates between them, using the best language of, uh, in this kind of uh, situation. The best language is the literary language. So the theory that I developed, uh, and that is the sort of precondition of this book, is that basically narrative writers or writers in general or literary people in a post-literary age, uh, like I think that we live in a post-literary age, can act uh, as bridgers, uh, as uh, bridge the gap uh, people between disciplines. And this could prove uh, a very interesting works for humanists uh, uh, as well, in, uh, in an era in which humanists can li literally are starving, are starving because the budget cuts in academia, all th things that you know pretty well, I think. And uh, especially literary humanists could be, so I found out that the best uh, translators between disciplines were, could be literary people with a wide sense of uh, curiosity, with a wide constant uh, uh, desire to learn and the desire to, and the will and the capacity to express uh, the huge sometimes gaps that uh, occur between a uh, architectural mind and a uh, choreographer mind. But sometimes, obviously, or uh, like musical minds, obviously there are some similarities, but when you deal a lot with the different people from different disciplines, like I did in the last 10 years, living between literary people, architectural people, designer people, and artists and curators, and sometimes scienti scientists, you really, I can really testify 
with my life and I could do it with, under any like uh, like uh, <laughs> um, uh, juror, a uh, judge, I mean, I could really testify that the differences between mindsets are more relevant than the will to find analogies. So everybody is curious about other languages, especially now that this cross-disciplinarity thing is also a kind of fashionable thing. But in the end, when it comes to really work on the codes, on the transmigration codes, that is the moment in which things fall apart. Because in that situation, when you want to live at the border between disciplines, you have, you, you have to be prepared to, have your, to, to see your work considered a little less relevant. You, you have to be prepared to be less powerful, to have a sort of zigzag career, to be called eclectic, etc. We still are sometimes. And to be called, there's a, 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 an Italian word that is an horrible thing when people, I have a sort of public activity, especially in Italy, and when people want to insult me, they, they use a word that is horrible, that is, called, that is tutto, tuttologia, tuttologo, which means uh, every, it's difficult to translate, like uh, uh, every eologist. <laughs> Yeah, but actually, someone who tries to know everything is a good thing for me. What this tutology do, do, do actually is give an opinion on everything, which is a slightly different, it's not so slight, I mean, it's a very different thing. Because opinionism in newspapers, magazine culture, that's the kind of thing that ruin the cross-disciplinary attitude. Because I personally never give opinions or almost never give opinions to thi about things, even when newspaper asks them. But at the same time, I try to uh, learn and learn and learn by like almost as a sort of, an, um, uh, uh, how can I say, as a sort of uh, researcher between the spaces that separates uh, different brains, different kind of brains. And that's a sort of uh, reporting art is a sort of the art of reportage be, uh, from the borders. That's what those people do for me. All, hundred, all those hundred people are people who, have a, who could be as well confined to their own discipline. I basically, even myself, I published like four or five books. Now another is coming. One is being published by Gallimard in France next year. So I'm a, like, uh, sort of a pedigreed literary person, I must say, in a way. But at the same time, I found out that this literary uh, environment wasn't responding to the complexity of our world. And I could learn more. I, too, I could know more. And know other people like, no, no, like people like Umberto Eco were really uh, people who were on the verge of knowing everything. For Echo, that uh, he he did his thesis on Thomas Aquinas, and in the very in the same year, in the I think fifty three, he joined uh, Rai TV. Yeah. Um, and uh, this there was a move in Rai TV. Is the BBC Italian BBC? Kind of B Italian BBC, and so he joined as some uh, as as a kind of new generation to come up with ideas for programs and be presenters and. So I mean, maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about, about Echo, but somehow this seems very specific, or, or, or a crystal, crystalline or, um, nucleus, perhaps, of, of that kind of, you know, there's that great uh, F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, right? The definition of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to, to, to have two contradictory ideas at the same time and still retain the function of thought. <laughs> Right, so, so this business, like, uh, he's just done, you know, his thesis, his in-depth uh, work on medieval, on the third, on the great thirteenth century, neo Aristotelian, and he joins, and he t starts a television career. So, uh, could could we say that Echo is he one of the very f first of this emblematic? Uh, Absolutely. And 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 it's that, I mean, uh, not to put it so so so. 
I mean, it seems so crude now to talk about the academy versus popular culture, right? But perhaps in the 50s, at, of course, at the time when Barth was also beginning his newspaper articles, etc. It was maybe very this was quite very time. radical, right? I think that actually, uh, Echo was not literally cross-disciplinarian, if you could, because he was basically a professor, so someone who transmits knowledge and create produces knowledge, Produ production of knowledge and transmission of knowledge. That's at the core of the school in the end, uh, especially of academia. So he never quitted academia, and he was always an academic, always, from the moment he, he entered the faculty as a freshman to the, to, well, like the day he died. But he was certainly uh, cross-border, so he was a sort of certainly uh, someone who crossed borders between discipline and put, uh, uh, there's a beautiful way of putting it that he chose that is called uh, endless uh, semiosis, which, is, which basically means an endless activity of semiotic uh, interpretation of everything from uh, peanuts to uh, Joyce from the Red Big Brigade's uh, uh, terrorist activity in the Italian Italy in the 70s to uh, pornography. That's the revolutionary attitude that Echo imported. Because nobody before him, nobody, is, it, at least at the, in this radical way, was so uh, constantly determined to investigate everything mm. with a sort of uh, um, a radical will. There is a beautiful title of Susan Sontag, the first book of, by, of essays by Susan Tong, Sontag, who could as well be one of those figures, obviously, is uh, styles of radical will. And in this same fashion, she investigates uh, Bergman and uh, Norman Mailer, William Barrocks and uh, um, John Cage, uh, Merce Cunningham, and uh, the Black Panthers. Obviously, there is a big tradition, especially in literary figures like Umberto Eco, Susan Sotago, and by the way, they were kind of contemporaries at the time, uh, of investigating everything through uh, a sort of literary no attitude. But what uh, Eco did is the revolutionary attitude of uh, putting on the same level of semiosis things that were considered trivial at the time. Now we live in such a different era that we cannot even imagine how courageous was being a proper professor, like a proper academic, and the writer of a TV program. Even though we must say that at the time, uh, at the beginning of television, especially in Italy. Now the situation is after Berlusconi was a little bit different. But at the beginning, television was a mainly uh, linguistic tool in Italy because Italy was with their high rates of analfabet analfabetism. And uh, since it was a very young nation at the time, there were many dialects speaking. So people would have to learn Italian by watching TV. So that's why they employed literary figures on TV. And that's why it was also kind of, uh, I, I would say that being a, lit, uh, a, a programmer, a, an author, a TV author at the time, and an academic was less courageous and less paradigmatic than writing on this in the same week about uh, Charles Schultz, Peanuts, and Joyce. That was the main thing, because in this situation, he would be confronted by the Joycean academics and by the people who would love uh, uh, comics, because those two people wouldn't speak to each other. And I must say that all cross-disciplinary efforts really led and lead, sorry, to the non-comprehension, to the fact that you, by wanting to bring people together of different areas, of different classes, of different uh, uh, intellectual uh, disciplines, you risk, uh, you, you have a big risk of uh, getting nobody. Because of you want you want to make everybody at the same table, you risk that uh, at your dinner your invitation is uh, like your party is crushed. 
by everybody. So obviously it's a very risky. I, I'm not pretending that this, I mean, the book in itself uh, is really a guide to, to, to interesting contemporary thinkers. That's why, and I think, and that's a sort of statement that the best contemporary thinkers, or let's say the best is difficult to say, but the most daring ones are those who address this cross-disciplinary effort in order to understand the world that has become, you know that the world isn't changed so dramatic, it's obviously changed, but it's not so much that the world has changed, it's that our perception of the world has changed because we have access to so much information that is literally impossible to come out with a uh, general theory. And that's why in lacking a general theory is important to have a lot of knots, little knots. And I think that humanists could be the kings and queens of those knots, not the kings and queens, the, let's say the monks that is like medieval time, the monks that allow these knots to be enough uh, tied to be uh, stay to stabilize the knowledge and the culture, but also enough uh, elastic to to work. That's exactly what these people are doing. You know, one of the very uh, uh, popular things that uh, gets said today. There was actually a book that came out recently called The Shallows, which basically you know, claims that uh, the internet obviously uh, allows us an almost a seemingly infinite access to knowledge or information, and I think they're two different things, but maybe it's information that's parading as knowledge or vice versa. Um, but at the same time, our, 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 the depth of that understanding is shallow, right? So if... Um, uh, Alain Robgrier, before he became a writer, was an agronomist, right? So an agronomy would um, bore into the ground to take soil uh, samples to understand the sedimentation of the earth. What's interesting about agronomy is that it's kind of, it's very, um, uh, in terms of uh, kind of X, Y, it's very uh, precise. The depth is literally how deep you go, and, and and an understanding of that depth. It seems now the opposite, right? So, our the 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 area that we cover, our ability to move between a Kardashian and Kant, is you know equally uh, agile, um, but anything more uh, about either of those characters uh, becomes sort of difficult, you know. And I wonder whether, um, you know, you as a, a, a as a person that's directing a school, if we think about education, um, you know, the traditional uh, going back to the monks, for example, or the, or the basis of the university, the the notion of uh, at some point uh, education was the teaching of highly specific, uh, you know, information and knowledge. Uh, that would either make you, uh, you know, a better person, or would train you to be a better doctor or something like that. So how do you, how do we navigate? Uh, because I, uh, it seems to me there's, there's also a, there's, there's a very kind of toxic uh, underside to merely celebrating everythingness, right? Um, so how do we, you know, the, what is the fate of uh, a school? in relation to th th these contours of knowledge that we're already part of. I, does a school simply replicate that, or does it, uh, does it present a, a resistance to that, in a, in a way? I think that cross-disciplinarity versus monodisciplinarity, or like this, is a completely wrong track, completely wrong track. Because in order to be cross-disciplinary, and this is typical in the trans or cross-disciplinary, theory, in order to exist, you have to have people who are monodisciplinary and build that kind of knowledge. Mm. So I'm not telling, and it would be simply ridiculous to tell that we don't need any more specialized knowledge. We need specialized knowledge, but we also need these kind of figures. And that is the other way around, because I think I before we had a situation in which specialists dominated 
the academia still now it happens and specialists uh, who are claimed to be the highest form of knowledge my idea is that now the highest form of knowledge is a sort of combination between these two of uh, these two attitudes so what i would recommend to people especially to students if i can recommend something is to follow obviously an attitude there is there are basically isaiah berlin a great like the great philosopher and uh, political and historian of ideas and political thinker suggested two ways of uh, producing knowledge the ways of the hedge and the ways of the fox i think i don't know uh, richer la volpe richer uh, hedge hedge hedgehog hedgehog the hedgehog and the fox so basically the hedgehog was uh, more uh, quietly interested and focused on one single thing and the fox was jumping from one to the one one thing to the other isaiah berlin himself was writing about many different things i think that uh, these two types are psychological types are like inclinations and you cannot fight with inclination as everyone knows you cannot fight too much with inclination so i would suggest that uh, uh, inclination or towards specialism is still a very good thing but even the most specialist specialist could should be a little bit of uh, opened to other ways of thinking and i'm really meaning the expression ways of uh, thinking ways of producing uh, chains of thoughts this is what differentiate uh, disciplines an architect thinks in terms of uh, in terms that are radically different from a storyteller even if uh, there are many things in common between a storyteller and an architect uh, a poet thinks in radical and valorial terms like this gives value to different things in uh, respect to uh, a painter even there are if there are many things in common so what i suggest is that uh, the sp specialist gets open to uh, waves uh, uh, magnetic fields and traps uh, that comes from the learning and imitation of other kind of processes at the same time obviously that those cross-disciplinary if you want to become a cross-disciplinary hero first you have to have a discipline in both sense of the world like to have this to have discipline to be disciplined like to be organized in your way of uh, producing knowledge but and this is uh, sorry i apologize for the pun but to be to have a discipline to have a language of your own you cannot be that's why there are very 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 few i think just one or maybe two like journalists and i'm not speaking badly of journalists even if i think that journalists as the 20th century profession is uh, basically changing so 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 radically that it, i don't think that the, the classic journalist will survive uh, in the next uh, 20 years uh, as as we know it so i think that as a as a as a profession i mean so what i think uh, is that it's the cross disciplinary hero is someone who owns a language who can master a language but at the same time is so interested in other languages at least one or two other disciplines that he tries to import in this production of knowledge some methods some uh, methodologies that are owned by other uh, basically by other disciplines and believe me that if you start uh, importing these uh, methods different methods you really enter a realm of no man's land in which uh, is very difficult to, to navigate because it's very disquieting because for example I do a lot of uh, cross-disciplinary things with the artists, uh, like contemporary art people and literary people. Because many literary people are navigating into the contemporary art uh, system basically because of, because, of the, because of the money, because there are, there are more possibility to make a, lit, a, a living, possibilities that are not anymore provided by the publishing system, basically. So, and then the, I, I have my personal theory that the contemporary art system one has many flaws, but one of his best uh, 
uh, uh, characteristic is that it's one of the few social elevators in, uh, in a world that is uh, highly polarized. Uh, obviously, on the sa at the same time, the, the contemporary art system is a brutal representation of the wills and the power of the 1% or the 0, 1% or the 1%, but at the same time, is it's one of the few ways in which a representative of the 99% can have a ser serious talk uh, with a representative of the 0.1%, and that is always a, a good thing, especially in a world that in which uh, there is no any more uh, possibility of uh, like shared common ground between class be between these two uh, two big uh, um, uh, class uh, big classes. Uh, what I sh should add in this situation is that uh, contemporary art people and literary people have really one big difference difference in terms of uh, of production of knowledge, and it's a val it's a value system difference. So they give value to different things. I tell, you, I tell you an example. Literary people, whether you like it or not, uh, have uh, still now, after the, all the avant-garde, after Rob Grier, after we have, I must say as a literary person, have the myth of intelligibility, of, I wouldn't say clarity, but uh, uh, there's a word used by Thomas, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, which is claritas, which is also used by Joyce. So being intellectually understandable, I don't know how to explain better than this, but the idea that uh, the language is a semantic force uh, that uh, is uh, there for all to interpret, and everybody can interpret, and there are obviously many different aesthetic interpretations, but the text is the text. So is a sort of uh, uh, possibility to speak uh, in a transparent way. This leads uh, to, for example, a series of consequences. Many literary people now think that uh, being narrative is a good, is a, they, they are very interested in any way tell a story. Uh, something that most avant-gardists of the 60s were like Rob Grier, but there were avant-gardes uh, in literature everywhere. They declare, after Roland Barthes, the novel was de de declared dead in a way. And so many people in the literary realm decided that it was better off to start uh, creating texts that were highly unreadable in a way, because the world was unreadable and you know, uh, I'm simplifying, but that's, that was basically. The contemporary art people, curators, young artists, um, uh, basically, uh, people who pass by in, in galleries, they value exoterism. I'm always generalizing, but for the sake of claritas, uh, they like, uh, the, they don't like uh, over narrativizing, they don't like very clear storytelling, they don't like to, uh, they like uh, an exoteric kind of uh, uh, very, very, Speci not specific, but they want some always a little bit of twist in terms of uh, uh, production of uh, meaning. They don't want, and, and they don't want to be. They generally have suspicion about the possibility of being translated in a way. To put these two kind of people around the table to work on a project is a very difficult task because they give value to different things. They give different value to different things. So. Uh, the contemporary art people usually would uh, not love a writer like Jonathan Franzen, who is a very complex novelist, uh, is a very gifted novelist, probably the, the most gifted novelist of our time, but at the same time as a form of clarity in his uh, kind of uh, architectural narrative. Uh, is a, a narrative architecture, so he wants to be um, understand, he wants to be read. At the same time, the art people uh, are kind of uh, in love with the sort of complexity, complex, hyper complexity, and uh, like to find a way to balance these two attitudes is very difficult. It's really because you have to sacrifice some of your chess pieces. And this is like to respond to your mm. question. And you, you sort of you just mentioned that journalism may be one of the uh, many things that we 
uh, either are seeing in a process of decline or imminent, uh, you know, imminent uh, e extinction. Uh, but this this category uh, of a global mind itself yeah. is that uh, how much of that is a twentieth century fixation, uh, Oops. and how much is uh, or is it, uh, or is it a twenty-first or twenty-second century? Because um, let's let's say, I think everyone in the book uh, could be said to have been formed at the in the twentieth century, and uh, there isn't obviously a project like eighty-nine plus that Hans Ulrich has been doing, Simon Castets which is an attempt to survey uh, the generation born after 1989 in a way the digital native and so on and so forth, one could say is a different kind of global mind, yeah. right? Well, I must say that that this renaissance spirit of trying to know everything and trying to put different disciplines together was one of the characteristics of the first avant-garde mm. in, in the early 20th century. Was a we have to always to remember that the most important art movement of the 20th century, uh, at first of the first half uh, at least, uh, the two most important movements like futurism and surrealism were began, like the beginners of this movement were poets basically. Mm. Uh, uh, André Breton were literary people and uh, Marinetti. So this is not something that we should uh, underestimate because this is really important. And we must say that the, the great modernist, the father figure of all uh, modern literature, uh, uh, Charles Baudelaire, was so basically made a living out of uh, writing. The few money that he made was by writing uh, art critics, art criticism for the Salon. Uh, and I think he was one of the few that understood immediately the importance of Impressionism, for example. So I think that w it's been a part of modernism heritage, of early modernism heritage, the convergence of uh, those disciplines, of, the, of different disciplines. Then something happened, something that has to do with specialized culture, of, with mass culture, with pop culture, many different things. And Basically, there was a sort of a reaction, revolution, counter-revolution, and then it, it, it became a sort of university-driven knowledge, especially in the humanism. Post-structuralism and structuralism created a sort of a highly fragmented kind of um, landscape in which was very difficult to emerge as a sort of curator. You say that most of those people are kind of uh, or maybe you didn't say, but I feel it coming, like they, they are kind of journalists in a way, new kind of journalists. But I would say that they are co all curators, or they curate, uh, or most of them are curators even. There are some curators, especially like uh, there, there is Ansuri, there is Jens Hoffman, there is uh, uh, Caroline Christoph Bakarkiv. There are proper art curators, because I think that in the contemporary art world, there has been a special effort to bring disciplines together. Uh, the, the, a kind of uh, maybe a fashion, maybe something that is really felt. But, it, but anyway, this has been done. And I think that uh, most of these people are brought up in the 20th century because obviously the youngest person on this list is a wonderful writer called uh, Nicola Twilley. She's a journalist. But She's not, she's a storyteller, I would say. How old is she? Just she's 35. Go. She's 35 and she just wrote the most astonishing piece on the uh, gravitational waves uh, discovery mm -hmm. on the New Yorker. But what she usually writes for in the New Yorker magazine is uh, food. Mm -hmm. So this is a typical treat of the New Yorker magazine in which writers write about different things. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, the New Yorker magazine is one of the few uh, temples of 20th century culture that is still relevant in the 21st century, even if it's clearly not uh, um, 
or maybe not so clearly I couldn't say because I, I never saw the, <laughs> the the money book but I don't know it, if it's sustainable but it's clearly a sort of a reference and the fact and I, I never thought about it but now I'm thinking that the fact that in that, in, that, in that magazine all writers are forced to write about different things something that or I must say this that in the 20th century the culture of specialization was brought in by media and journalism because media and journalists were kind of a psychoanalytic representation of how we perceive ourselves. And the fact that in media and journalism there was a high rate of specialization, the chronicle right, the, the um, uh, crime writer just write about crimes, usually the political writer, the Vaticanist just write about the Pope. This created a sort of, uh, uh, and then there are the opinionists. So this created the fact that those who are speaking about n different things, they just give opinions, but that's the right, the, the wrong thing to do. I think that those who are more interested in things are, the more you get interested in other disciplines, the less you can give an opinion, it's exactly the opposite. And it's by giving less opinion that you become less, power, uh, less powerful, because people give power to people who give a lot of opinions. That's what politics, democratic elections are about. Who are, what are elo elec elections, if not races between two people, two highly opinionated people. But I think that all these people, and especially father's figures, or big brother's figures like uh, Ansu Recobres are exactly the opposite. So are kind of inclusive. Obviously they are highly opinionated in their own terms, but they are becoming like media themselves. They are a medium. All these people are not even curators. They are museums. So they are including information, things. Their body, most of these people are body artists in a way because their favorite medium, the favorite media is the poetics of relation, which is that particularly aesthetic effort that brings intelligence together. Like someone like John Brockman, who was one of the minds. He started this beautiful club that is called edge.org. And edge.org is not only the only newsletter that you really, as, uh, apart from the AA newsletter, that you really want to receive every week, but because it's so full of interesting things, but it's a club of scientists that welcome humanists. And the relationship between s scientists and humanists and technologists and humanists will be the most political most important political things in the next future, because if humanists don't talk to scientists and technologists, clearly artificial intelligence will be uh, mm, making the world a very different thing in, a, in, ten, in twen, 10 to 20 years. So what I must say that training people to become natural born translator, not artificial born translator, like between disciplines, especially scientific disciplines and humanistic discipline, especially and then politics, like in a way, this is the most political, urgent thing to do for humanists because people will be like, I just to tell you something. There is a high. There is a ter sense of uh, ex exoterism in the technological progress now. That is almost reaching the kind of exoterism that. Uh, a mark the, the financial uh, the financial language so you basically don't understand every every time the financial people want to invent a new way of cheating they invent new new names new there's a Roland Barthes created a beautiful new word for people who invent word which is logotet which is a word from Greek logos and logoteta which is inventing new words and he's uh, inventing new discourse. So the financial people are inventing constantly new words and new discourse for things that are more and more complex, more and more phantasmatic, more and more relevant. And I think that in a way, to have people who are not only divulgating, not only divulgators, but are interpreters and curators, because there is so much information that you really need. And the only one that can do this is are people who have already a sort of uh, humanistic and holistic take on, on knowledge. And literally, people are 
uh, kind of uh, interesting, but also architectural people and all the people that uh, deal with everyday life. What is a novelist about? And that's uh, one of the most important similarities between an architect and a novelist. Can Did you tell you? us, w uh, just as we... Yeah, yeah, I'm we, sorry. We, I'm we sort of near the end, but I just, for those people who haven't necessarily seen the book or gone through it, I wonder if you could just speak uh, in terms of specifics. So. Who are the architects you've put in here, and who are the who are the novelists you've yeah. put in here, for example? So basically, architects. Obviously, there is Rem Kulas because Arch is a perfect example of a writer, journalist, uh, uh, lent to architecture, then lent to like global f philosophy, uh, urban thinker, or something like this. Um, there is Jonah Friedman in terms of architecture and design because obviously he was anticipating most of these. Uh, convergency. Um, there is uh, uh, people like uh, Thomas Piketty, who's an economist who brought in, 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 in the economy study a lot of sociology and a lot of uh, literature. For example, one of the things that he does in the book about capital in the 21st century is uh, using Balzac as an example to see the different, the social uh, uh, difference. There is um, Ute Metabauer, who's a curator, but in the end uh, she directed MIT, uh, uh, one of the departments of the MIT, then directed the Royal, uh, the Royal College, then now is in, she's in Singapore, then, but she also did Documenta, so I mean, one of those key, this is Colas. Then um, there is uh, Joan Didion, because she She's one of those uh, few writers that were really capable of uh, writing about very, very different topics uh, from politics to California, from Hawaii to uh, Cuba, with an in impressive way of knowledge, of uh, producing knowledge in a, like... Uh, but wasn't that the function of a journalist? So yeah. where does the journalist stop and the cross-disciplinary writer begin? That's the, that's the most important question in this situation. It stopped when journalists became a, a specializing, pro, a, a machine to produce specialism. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when because there are so few literary writers who can write about everything without being or just giving opinion mm -hmm. on things. Like for example, why there's not Tom Wolf? Tom Wolf is in do, out of doubt a very important. Uh, um, non-fiction writer, but he's not exactly a reporter. He's a sort of judgmental, ironic, sat satirist. And I don't think that satire is what we need to understand the world in. This is a completely different thing. Obviously, there is a certain degree when you spe spoke about the method, that which is what we did after we gave up the algorithm. Basically, I decided out of those selected by the students, then selected by the algorithm, I decided to who's in, who's out based on a vision of what should be cross-disciplinarity. Obviously, I considered many factors, uh, but at a certain moment, I wanted a biodiversity of uh, careers. That's why we have like uh, Caroline Crystal. There is uh, uh, Gilles Clement, for example, among architects. Even if I think that now his research has a kind of uh, became flat now, but in the past 10 or 20 years, he represented a sort of a halfway through between a sort of description, naturalist, uh, bit, uh, a gardener, and, a, and an architect and an urbanist. So then there is uh, um, Karsten Oehler. There are a few artists. I try to put in uh, and to favor those artists who can write, who can like elaborate a complex way of thinking. Uh, and then, obviously, there, are other, there is a, an Italian architect, Stefano Boeri, because Stefano Boeri did a magazine. Uh, he was the editor of Domus magazine, and his three years of editorship of that magazine transformed the magazine from an architectural magazine, who, which was already very open, because the tradition of Domus was always to bring in art, design, and architecture in a very open and cultivated way. But basically, during Stefano's editorship, you really couldn't tell what what was that object? It was a completely UFO. It was un completely unidentifiable. And that's what is the interesting thing. When something becomes so unidentifiable that uh, 
it exceeds the limits of marketing. So it cannot be marketed anymore. That's why cross-disciplinarity don't sell, doesn't sell, in a way. In other way, it's very fashionable. But the real, because an attitude of being constantly curious, matching a sort of flat curiosity with the, with the sheer and clear respect of monodisciplinarity, so matching horizontal research and vertical research, because that's what uh, that magazine was doing. An intuition driven by a restless curiosity that met always with the, the research made by a loner researcher in the University of Texas and who could provide the specialist part. But the thing that was that the holistic vision that dominated the magazine was a vision in which culture was only the result of a dialogue between different disciplines. That's what I, and then the, there are other architects. Right now. There is Joseph Grima, for example. Yeah, he's a teacher here. There is Brian Eno, many other people. And uh, actually, my, one of my last questions is uh, one area where actually the, the notion of um, cross-disciplinarity or poly, polydisciplinarity has become oh, yeah. extremely popular is that of TED Talks. Right? Absolutely. So they love to boast over a billion TED Talks have been watched or you know, at least uh, 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 looked up uh, and that what people are doing in their lunch times uh, <laughs> instead of you know, going out uh, to have a fag or something is sit there and, and take in two TED Talks. You know? <laughs> so is, I, I wonder what your your opinion is about something like TED uh, in relation to uh, your notion of either cross or polydisciplinarity and whether uh, you see any uh, commonality there or you think there's something very, very different happening? Uh, I think that TED is still, especially the proper TED yeah. conference is uh, still very interesting. And I'm not trying to be politically correct, but I, st I think have that they ever invited you. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they, have they invited me to some minor TED events. But actually, the omnicomprehensivity of TED is that they could invite uh, people to talk about uh, a different version of polydisciplinarity or cross-disciplinarity that is actually um, fighting with their own vision because they basically it's a sort of absorbing force now. Uh, I think that TED in the end, whether you like it or not, is one big flow in my opinion that is still too much uh, anchored to a TV. It's, it's clearly a product of someone that who was brought up with TV. It's still a TV format in the end. While Obviously, it's interesting The people who spoke this year was, uh, were like in Vancouver were phenomenal and it would be stupid to dismiss a format like this in a, in a... What I think in the end is that what is missing from the, that kind of format is the bizarre, the improvisation is very, very... Uh, market oriented in a way. Basically now Ted is becoming a success story, mm. over success stories, over success stories. And I think that uh, my idea of cross disciplinarity is finding the weirdos, finding the corners of knowledge production, the wunder, living wunderkammer, uh, minds that work like wunderkammers. Clearly Ted is a wonderful uh, power assessment. Well, one of the things that I like to think in terms of this book is that most of these people, and I also think of uh, myself in this situation, is that people that never really feel entitled, or if they feel entitled, they don't show it up, show it up too much. It's a laboratory of doubt. There is a beautiful Karsten Eller work that is called The Key to the Laboratory of Doubt. I actually, we la launched a small institution, as a temporary institution in Italy called the Laboratory of Doubt, because I think that all these people work with the not feeling exa all entitled. 
I'm not entitled to speak. And that's exactly the, 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 the other, the opposite of, uh, um, I think that the opposite of TED some, sometimes is edge.org because it's a, a serious uh, researcher working on very special, and they are not uh, limiting, limited to the idea of uh, speaking 15 minutes or 17 minutes, etc. But anyway, it's a good format. I'm not sure that it represents complexity, and then it's too big a thing to, man it's too big to fail, so it's, I, there's it's like uh, TV. I mean, Recently, The Guardian posted uh, a short piece about, you know, 10 things that David Bowie had said no to, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't including read it. I just Dave Grohl, you know, from the Foo Fighters, uh, was the most recent person that apparently David Bowie said no. Uh, Coldplay asked him to sing, sing on a song, and he said, it's not a very good song, is it? Uh, and refused. But he also famously refused uh, to, be, to be knighted. And, you know, in this country, there's a really big thing about, uh, those people who refuse to, you know, get an OBE or a, or a CBE, uh, and 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 sort of uh, Bowie is very much praised for 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 kind of being consistent in the, in this respect. I'm very interested. I would love to know. I'd love to see a list of people who've been invited to TED and said no, <laughs> uh, because I'm I I think those are the people I would like the yeah, most. Yeah, but consider in the world. Consider uh, the fact that Jean-Paul Sartre said no to the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not common now. It's today, nobody would do that, nobody. There's no single, not even, not even Julian Assange or people like this, especially Julian Assange, would not say, but because of other reasons. But consider that there was a time in the world in which people really said no to, and, and that saying no is a typical 20th century thing, which, uh, Sometimes, uh, and I'm I'm not a big uh, no sayer, <laughs> because uh, all those people are very in curious, and if you are very curious, it's very difficult to say no. But, like, I, maybe I stopped even a uh, new word. No, it's fine. I mean, uh, one of the great TV formats was 60 minutes. Uh, we've had our 60 minutes, uh, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Gianluigi Recuperati yeah. this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for speaking. And thank you all for coming. It, it was a bit wacky, and it's, I was like, I haven't seen this part. Maybe because it's